fit for a king and a priest. So, Father, into your hands I commit this time. May you find our worship of you acceptable. May you eliminate the distractions. Help us to focus our hearts and our minds upon you. And may you speak through me this morning and give me your words to proclaim. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want you to imagine something for a minute. Imagine it's your birthday is coming up. And the town decides to make a big to-do of your birthday. So they start advertising in the newspaper about your birthday. They start advertising on TV about your, your birthday. They even make songs up about your birthday. And as your birthday draws closer and closer, the anticipation and excitement about your, your birthday builds. But then the big day comes, and you're not even invited to the party. But you decide to go anyhow, and you sneak in. And inside, you see that everyone is having a festive time, uh, uh, partying, exchanging gifts, and no one even recognizes you at your own party. How would that make you feel? You know, every year on Jesus' birthday, we celebrate Christmas, but we don't invite Jesus to the party. Instead, we invite this big fat guy in a red suit that goes, ho, 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 right? It's not about him. It's about Jesus. It's about the birth of, of, of Christ, right? I want to ask you, how do you celebrate Christmas? What's your view of, of Christmas? What's the reason of the, the season? You see, we have a tendency to get caught up in a lot of stuff, don't we? We can get caught up in, okay, we got to buy the presents, we got to write the cards, we got to do this and that, and, and we get so busy doing all the commercialism aspects of, of Christmas that we, we forget to invite Jesus. We forget that this party is about Jesus Christ. So I'm going to look at some three things, as a matter of fact, this morning that will help us keep Christ in Christmas. Three ways that over this holiday season, that's the reason I'm starting this Advent time, this, uh, as we're heading up towards Christmas, that's the reason I'm starting with this sermon, so that we can keep this Advent time in a proper perspective. And I want to give us some, some things that we can do to help keep Christmas in a proper pers perspective. And number one, if you want to fill in your handout, the Christmas story must be remembered. It must be remembered. We have a tendency to forget, don't we? we it's easy to get caught up in the commercialism and think it's about Santa Claus and getting gifts. But you know what? It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. If you would, turn to John 3.16, page 1617 in your pew Bible. It's a beautiful song, the hallelujah. I'll be, that's in my head. I'll be in my head all week. <laughs> no, no, no. Hallelujah. We'll stick with hallelujah. So number one, the Christmas story must be remembered. A in your handout is Christmas reminds us that God loves us. So we have to remember two truths. We have to remember the Christmas story must be remembered, but what are we remembering? The first thing we're remembering is about Christmas is God loves us. That's what the Christmas story is all about. That's what the Christmas story tells and I think the Christmas story can be found here in John 3.16. And it says, for God so loved you. You substitute the word world there with your name. That he gave his one and only son. You see, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is Jesus Christ. God has given us his gift at Christmas. And that gift came in the form of a manger 2,000 years ago, a baby in a manger 2,000 years ago. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Man, let Christmas remind you that God loves you. You see, if God was going to desert us, he would have left us in the Garden of Eden. Anytime you doubt God's love, I want you to remember not only Christmas, but you've got to remember the cross as well, don't you? Because you can't look at Christmas without looking at the, the, the cross as well. You see, in creation, God showed us his hand, didn't he? But at Christmas, God showed us his heart. He gave us his one and only son. 
The second truth we need to remember is without Jesus, we die in our sins. Look at John 8.24, a couple of pages over, page 16.29. This is Jesus talking. Are you with me? Jesus said, I told you, you would die in your sins if you do not believe I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. Well, that begs the question, who did Jesus claim to be? Well, Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. Uh, the Hebrew word for Messiah is anointed one. The Greek word for uh, uh, anointed one is Christ. You see, Christ is not a surname. That, that means Jesus, he is the anointed one. Jesus is the Messiah. That's who Jesus claimed to be. And not only did he just claim to be, you know, anybody can claim to be the Messiah, right? But Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy about the Messiah. There's over 300 Old Testament prophecies about the coming Messiah, and Jesus fulfilled them all. And the mathematical probability of someone fulfilling just eight Old Testament prophecies is one in 100 million billion. Research it. Don't ask me how I got that number. <laughs> okay. If you would, turn to Isaiah 61. I've got to move quickly. We don't have a lot of time. Page 1122 in your pew Bible. Isaiah 61. Verse 1, page 1122 in your pew Bible. Are you there? Now this tells of the Messiah, of the, the coming role of the Messiah. And it says, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me. Remember, Jesus claims to be the anointed one, anointed with the Holy Spirit. Has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and a release from darkness for the prisoners. Now go to Luke chapter 4, verse 14, page 1565 in your pew Bible. And this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He had just finished the, the wilderness temptation. And this is the beginning of his ministry. And, and Jesus is, is in the temple that day, and he's called upon to, to read for that day. So Jesus stood up, and the reading that day, they had different readings for that day. And the reading for that day was Isaiah chapter 61. Is that a coincidence or a God incidence? I think that's a God incidence. So Jesus stands up to read Luke 4, verse 14. Are you with me? Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. He went to Nazareth, verse 16. I'm sorry, I skipped to verse 16. He went to Nazareth, into the synagogue, and he stood up to read. Verse 17. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recover sight for the blind and to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And Jesus, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So what is Jesus saying here? Jesus is saying, I am the anointed one. I am the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy. And Jesus said, you will indeed die in your sins if you do not believe I am the one I claim to be. Jesus says his mission here. He says, I have come to set the prisoners free from sin. I've come to release the oppressed. I've come to give sight to the blind. What does that mean? Well, 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, Satan has blinded the mind of, of unbelievers so they cannot see the glory of God. And Jesus has come to, to set the captives free, to break the chains from, from our lives, and to open up our eyes to, to the truth. That's Jesus' mission. 
That's the role of the Messiah, the anointed one. That's what Christmas is all about. That's the gift God has given us at Christmas. That's the gift. That's the true gift that that we have. You know what's sad is December 25th, all over the world, people are going to be celebrating Christmas. But you know what? They're still in darkness. They're still blinded. They're still oppressed. And they really have nothing to celebrate, do they? Nothing to celebrate because they've never received the gift of Jesus Christ. They never believed Jesus who he claimed to be. I asked this question in the first service, and I was surprised with the number of people who raised their hands. I want to ask you this question. Who in this sanctuary here has been a Christian over 10 years? Raise your hand. Over 10 years. Again, I'm surprised. Quite a few of you. Then this passage belongs to you. Look at Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, page 1777 in your pew Bible. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, page 1777. You know, Paul's talking mainly about the Jews and the Gentiles, and, uh, and he's reminding the Jews how they used to be without Christ. And you know what? Some of us, we have been Christians so long, we have forgotten what it's like to be without Christ. So Paul says in, in, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, do you remember? That at that time you were separate from Christ excluded from the citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God. Underline that, because that's how it is to go through this world without Christ. You're without hope, you're without God. Do you remember how it used to be before you knew Christ? Some of us have been Christians so long, we've forgotten what it's like to go through this world without hope and without God. But Jesus came to set the captives free, didn't he? He came to to give sight to the blind. He came to to reconcile us back to God. We've experienced that hope, that grace and mercy. But now he's called us to help others experience that hope. You see, when December 25th comes for a lot of people and they open up the presents, like that old song I remember, I forget who sang it, is that all there is, my friend, right? Is that all there is? It's emptiness. Once, once the paper's all on, all on the ground and, and the boxes are open, it's like, wow, all, all hype. That's all Christmas is, is all hype. Exactly right. That's exactly what Christmas is, unless you invite Jesus to the party. Unless you remember it's all about Jesus. And he's the reason for our hope. So those of you who have been a Christian a long time, I want you to remember what it was like for you to be without Christ without God, without hope in in this world. Amen? Let's look at the second thing that we need to do. First first thing we need to remember, right? We need to remember. Second is the story has to be retold. One way we retell the story is by supporting missions. Every year we take up an offering for Lottie Moon. You saw the video here. And as I said in the first service, after watching the video, it's my first time watching it uh, at the 9 o'clock service, and as I watched the service, two things hit me. Number one, I don't do nearly enough as I should for the Lord. Not nearly enough as I I should. I mean, here's a, a young couple, and the lady said it. I don't know if you picked up on it. She goes, it's a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice to be where they're at and do what they're doing. And understand, to serve Christ, it's going to be a sacrifice. You're going to have to give up some creature comforts to, to, to serve Christ. But we have to tell the story. We have to support missions, and we support missions by giving money. That's one way you can, you can support missions. And you know what I can assure you is 100% of that money goes to support the missionaries. Within our convention, missionaries do not have to come home and drum up money. They don't have to. What we do is we pool all our resources so our missionaries can stay on the field. And there's something else you can do. You can pray for missionaries. Everyone has one of these in your, in your bulletin. I want you to open this up. And you can see there's eight. This is the week of prayer for missionaries. This week we're getting into. There's eight people you can pray for. 
the very first one, that's the couple that we saw in the movie. Very first one, the Harrell family. So you can start off by praying for the Harrell family. And don't think, you know, who am I? How can I possibly make a difference praying for one person? I won't tell this if a lot of you raise your hand. How many of you ever heard the starfish illustration? Okay, I'm telling it. There was a boy walking along the beach. And all the starfish, there were thousands of starfish that had been washed up on the, on the shore. So the boy's walking along the beach and he picks one up and throws it in the water. He walks a little bit more, picks one up, throws it in the water. And the guy's behind him and says, what are you doing? He says, you cannot possibly make a difference with all these starfish. And the boy just ignored him. He reached down, picked up another starfish, threw it in the water and said, made a difference to that one. See, sometimes we think we can't possibly make it. I'm just one person. What can I possibly do praying for one missionary? You know, D.L. Moody was a great evangelist. He only had like a sixth grade education. And the other pastors, preachers, pretty much shunned him because he was uneducated. Uh, and they had their scholarly degrees. But you know what? God used D.L. Moody in a mighty way. And here's why. D.L. Moody was challenged one time. He heard someone say, the world has yet to see what God can do through one person, just one person who is totally committed. Now, that's not totally true. We can see in the Bible, we see David and Daniel. But, you know, I, I think in our modern day and age, we've yet to see what God can do through one person who is totally committed. And D.L. Moody said, I want to be that person. You see, if you're, going to, if you're going to retell the story, it's going to be a commitment on your part. It's going to be a sacrifice. Because you're either going to have to give money, you're going to have to sacrifice some time and pray, or here's the third option, you can go yourself. We're going to, in January, every January, we have some booths set up in the Fellowship Hall, and we have different missions you can get involved in. And I already know of one in Mexico that we're, we're definitely going to try to get involved in, so, uh, support an orphanage over there in Mexico. Is it dangerous? Yes. But if God is calling you to it, he'll protect you, won't he? Absolutely. Now, here's the fourth option. So the first is you can, you, you can give to missions. The second is you can pray. And the third is you can go. And the fourth option is you can pray, give, and go. But you need to, to retell the story. I want to challenge you to something. I want to challenge you to invite someone to, 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 to church during uh, uh, the Christmas season. I, uh, in 2007, I went to the Billy Graham Evangelistic Training Seminar. And they just uh, uh, questioned people in, in the seminar, about 100 individuals there. And they said, okay, how many of you came to Christ through an evangelistic seminar? Maybe two or three raised their hands. How many of you came to Christ by watching a preacher on TV? And maybe uh, uh, five or ten more raised their hands. Then they asked, how many of you came to Christ because someone invited you to church? About 80, 90 percent raised their hands. So I'm asking you, one way to retell the story is real simple. Invite someone to church with you. Invite someone maybe to the Christmas Eve service or the Sunday morning. Yes, we are having Sunday morning worship service on Christmas Day. What a concept. Right? Because after all, it's his birthday. That's why we're celebrating. It's his birthday. We're here to honor him. So I, I encourage you to, to invite someone to, uh, to church. Romans 10.14 says, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one they have not heard? How can they hear unless someone tells them? There are 7 billion people in the world today. 4 billion people do not know Christ. You know what the fastest growing religion in America is? Someone who wasn't in the first service? Islam. Just Google it. I, that's what I did. I just typed in, what is the fastest growing religion in America today? And, and multiple sites said Islam, Islam, Islam is the fastest growing religion. That's scary. That's scary. So who is going to tell these four billion people about Christ? Who is going to retell the story? Are we counting on the Muslims to do it? Absolutely not. We know that won't happen. 
Are we counting on the Buddhists, the Mormons, Jehovah Witnesses? That won't happen. So I guess it points back to you and me, doesn't it? I want you to point to your neighbor right now. Just point to your neighbor and say, it's your job. Your job. Now keep your finger there. How many fingers do you have pointing back at you? Right? Okay. That's right. It's your job. That's right. It's your job to tell others about Christ. It's not your neighbor's job. It's your job. And one easy way to do it is just invite someone to, to, to church. That, that's, that's all you have to do. Oprah Winfrey is quoted as saying, One of the biggest mistakes human makes is to believe there is only one way to God. Actually, there are many diverse paths leading to what you call God. But Jesus said, If you don't believe I am the one I claim to be, you will indeed die in your sins. Who are you going to believe, Oprah or Jesus? I'm betting my life on Jesus. I'm here to, here to tell you. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So let's look at your handout. I want to make sure we've gotten the blanks, okay? Number two, the Christmas story must be retold. A, we are to tell the story by supporting missions, by giving money. Two, for praying for missionaries or going yourself. And then B, is to tell the story yourself, okay? Number three, the Christmas story helps you realize your need for Christ. You know, we celebrate Christmas is the most prepared for event, I think, all year. People start in August preparing for Christmas. Uh, we started our Christmas cantata in August preparing for Christmas, People make their travel arrangements in August, preparing for, for Christmas. Schools let out early to take off a few weeks for, for Christmas. We, we buy new clothes, and, uh, uh, but these are all worldly ways to, to prepare. So I want to look at two ways that we can prepare spiritually, okay? And the first is you need to, uh, first way to prepare is to repent, as John the Baptist preached. He said in Matthew 3, 1, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the desert of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom is near. Now, what do you think of when you think of the word repent? You know what I think of? I think of grace and mercy and love. Because what would happen if we served a God who didn't allow us to repent? If there was no repentance... You see, we serve a God who says, you know what? Yeah, I know you've blown it, but I'm willing to take you back. If you'll turn back to me, I promise to forgive you. In fact, I love you so much, I'm going to send my son to die on the cross for your sins. So that if you would believe in me, you would not perish, but you would have everlasting life with me in heaven. I've done all that I could do to show my, my, my love for you. Now I'm asking you to return. You see why repentance means to me love and grace and mercy? It's not a negative word, repent. It's a positive word. God allows us to, to repent, to turn from our old way of life and, and, and turn to receive the gift of Christmas. So let me ask you this. We're preparing for Christmas. First of all, have you prepared yourself to receive Christmas? And what I mean by that is, what if Jesus Christ came back December 25th? What if? Would you be prepared right now to stand in front of Christ? Have you believed Jesus, when he said, I am the Messiah, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am God's gift, the way that you can be reconciled back to God, because I died on the cross for your sins. Who else died on the cross for your sins? Who else? So how can, how can anyone else say that they're the way? What gives Jesus the right to say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, because he's the one who died on the cross for your sins? But not only that, anybody could die on a cross. I can die on a cross. But how many people can rise from the grave on the third day? Giving us life, giving us hope beyond the, the, the grave. You see, the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's what we all learn. But Jesus overcame death by rising from the grave on, on the third day. And when we receive Christ as our Lord and Savior, the Bible says the same spirit that raised Christ from the grave comes within us as well. And seals us and secures uh, us for what's awaiting for us in, in heaven. 
A little boy came home from Sunday school one time, and his mother asked, uh, what did you learn? The little boy said, my Sunday school teacher told me that this world is only a place where God lets us live a while so that we may prepare for a better world. Then the child then asked the mother, but mother, I don't see anyone preparing. I see you preparing to go to the country and Papa preparing to go to work. I don't see any preparing. Why isn't anybody preparing and getting ready, Mama? So I want to ask you this morning, are, are you ready? Are you preparing for Christmas? And there's one way you can prepare, and that's by repenting. And then B is by receiving Jesus Christ as, as your Lord and Savior. If you haven't done that, now is the time of God's favor. A student came up to a pastor one day, and he asked him, how long may I safely put off receiving Christ as my Lord and Savior? And the pastor said, well, until the, the day before you die. And the student said, but I don't know when I'm going to die. So the pastor said, well, you better do it today then, huh? You see, now is the time of God's favor. 2 Corinthians 6.2 says, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the time of salvation. How are you preparing for Christmas? Because if you haven't received the gift that God has prepared for you in Jesus Christ, you're not ready for Christmas. You may think you're ready. You're prepared by a worldly standard, but not God's standard. And the second way we can prepare for Christmas is prepare to tell the good news of Jesus Christ to someone. I challenge each and every one of you to invite someone to church over the Christmas season. This is the one time of year where it's easiest to tell the, the, the story, the gospel. Do you understand that? Everybody is celebrating Christmas. Everybody. All you have to do is say, well, let me tell you about Christmas. Let me tell you the, the true meaning of Christmas. You see, God so loved us that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believed in him would not perish but have eternal life. You already have, you see, the hardest way to, to think about witnessing is, is getting from the secular to the sacred. For me, that's the hardest. How do I get this conversation going? How do I, how do I get from talking about the cowboys to, to Christ, right? How do I bridge that gap? Man, we have it at Christmas. It's already bridged. Christmas is right there. You just need to fill in the, the ends. This is the one time a year we can easily talk about Christ. One time a year. So I, I encourage you to do that. To be ready. Get others ready. Because remember, they're in this world without God and without hope. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I thank you that you have given us the greatest gift that we could ever receive in your son Jesus. Father, if there's someone here this morning or this afternoon who has not received the greatest gift that they could ever receive. They may, not, may they not put it off any longer. May this day, may they surrender their lives to you so that you can set them free. Because you have come to set the captives free. You have come to, to heal our wounds. You have come to give sight to the blind. You have come to, to, to allow us to repent and we could seek reconciliation and forgiveness and experience your grace and mercy and love. So, Father, if there's someone here today who is still without hope, who is still without God, who still doesn't believe the one that you claim to be, then may this be the day that they prepare for Christmas, that they receive the greatest gift that they could ever receive in your Son, Jesus Christ. And, Father, for the rest of us here, oh, Father, help us to be bold in retelling this story. Help us to be bold, especially during this Advent time, during this Christmas season. We have the greatest news in the world. As people grope around in darkness and without hope, we have the keys to the kingdom. So, Father, use our, our words because we know that you, you can't use our silence, but you can use our words. So, Father, we just make ourselves available to you during this Christmas season that you would have our lives intersect with those who are without hope, without God. And that we would always be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have in Christ Jesus our Lord. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's